You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. This is a reading of the lecture cycle, Practical Advice to Teachers by Rudolf Steiner, given in 1919. This is Lecture 1, August 21st, 1919. My dear friends, First, we must make the distinction that the lectures on education in general differ from those in this course, which will deal more with specific teaching methods. I would also like to say a few words as an introduction, since the methods we will use differ from the prevalent teaching methods, which are based on premises very different from ours. Our own methods will certainly not differ from the other methods applied so far, merely out of obstinacy, for the sake of being new or different, They will be different because we must begin to see the special tasks of our age and how we must teach so that future humanity can fulfill the developmental impulses prescribed by the universal cosmic order. We must realize above all that by employing our method we will in a certain way harmonize the higher human being, the human spirit and soul, with the physical body, our lower being. The subjects you teach will not be treated as they have been up to now. In a way, you you must use them to develop the soul and physical forces of the individual correctly. The important thing for you is not to transmit information as such, but to utilize knowledge to develop human capacities. First and foremost, you must begin to distinguish between the conventional subject matter of tradition, though this may not be stated clearly and concisely, and knowledge based on the recognition of universal human nature. When you teach children, reading and writing today simply consider the place of reading and writing in culture as a whole. We read, but the art of reading evolved through the development of culture. The shapes of our letters and the connections among their shapes are purely a matter of convention. By teaching children reading as it exists today, we teach them something that means absolutely nothing to them as human beings, apart from its context within a particular cultural period. We must be aware that Nothing we practice in terms of material culture has any direct significance whatsoever for supra-physical humankind or for the supra-physical world. The belief advocated in certain quarters, especially among spiritualists, is that spirits use human script to bring the supra-sensory into the physical world. In reality, this is incorrect. Human writing is derived from human activity and convention on the physical plane. Spirits are not the least interested in complying with such physical conventions. Although it is true that spirits communicate with us, they do so only through the medium of a person who fulfills a kind of translation function. Spirits do not themselves directly transform what lives in them into a form that can be written and read. The reading and writing you teach children is based on convention. It came about within the realm of physical life itself. Teaching children arithmetic is a very different matter. You get the sense that the most important thing in arithmetic is not the shapes of the numbers, but the reality living in them. This living reality has much more meaning for the spiritual world than what lives in reading and writing. Finally, if we begin to teach children various activities that we may call artistic, We enter an area that has a definite eternal meaning, something that reaches up into the activity of the human spirit and soul. In teaching children reading and writing, we work in the most exclusively physical domain. In arithmetic, our teaching becomes less physical, and in music or drawing or in related fields, we really teach the children's soul and spirit. In a rationally conducted lesson, we can combine these three impulses of the supraphysical in artistic activity, the partially supraphysical in arithmetic, and the completely physical in reading and writing. In this way we harmonize the human being. Imagine, for example, approaching a child by saying, quote, you have seen a fish, haven't you? Unquote, parenthesis, today I am merely introducing the subject, just touching on certain points aphoristically. Parenthesis, quote, try to remember what the fish looked like when you saw it. If I do this on the blackboard, it looks very like a fish, doesn't it? 
unquote. Quote, the fish you saw looked something like this drawing on the blackboard. Imagine you wanted to say fish. What you say when you speak the word fish is present in this sign. Now try to now try not to say fish, but only start to say it. Unquote. Here we try to teach the child only to begin the word fish, F. Quote, there you see, you have started to say fish. Now suppose people in ancient times gradually began to simplify this sign. When you start to say fish, F, you express this in writing by making only this sign. People call this sign F. So you have learned that what you express by saying fish begins with F. Now you write it down as F. Whenever you start writing fish, you breathe F with your breath. So you learn the sign when you start to say fish. When you begin by appealing to children's nature this way, you really transport them to earlier cultural ages, because this is the way writing originally came about. Later on, the process became a mere convenience, so we no longer recognize the relationship between the abstract shapes of letters and the images that came about purely through things that were seen and reproduced as drawings. All letters arose from such image forms, and now consider that if you teach the child only what is conventional by saying, quote, this is how you make an F, unquote, what you teach is purely derivative and unrelated to any human context. This is how we divorce writing from its original context, the medium of art. So we begin to teach writing by using art and by drawing forms. We use the forms of consonants when we want to reach back far enough that children will be moved by the differences in the forms. It is not enough to tell the children merely through speaking what is exact which is exactly why people are the way they are today. By removing the shapes of letters from the current convention and showing their source, we move the whole being of the child, who thus becomes very different than would otherwise be the case if we appeal only to the intellect. We must not allow ourselves to think only in abstractions. Instead, we must teach art in drawing, and so on, teach soul substance in arithmetic, and teach reading and use art to teach the conventional in writing. In other words, we must permeate all of our teaching with an element of art. From the very beginning, we will have to greatly emphasize our encouragement of children's artistic capacities. The artistic element especially affects the human will in a powerful way. So we arrive at what is related to the whole human being, whereas everything related to convention remains in the realm of the head. So we proceed in a way that enables every child to draw and paint. We start with the simplest level, with drawing and painting. We also begin by cultivating music, so that children quickly become accustomed to handling a musical instrument. This also generates an artistic feeling in children. From this, children also learn to sense, in their whole being, what would otherwise be mere convention. Our task is to find teaching methods that continually engage the whole human being. We would not succeed in this endeavor if we failed to concentrate on developing the human sense of art. By developing this sense, we lend strength to the future inclination of children to become interested in the world in ways that are appropriate to each individual's total being. The fundamental flaw so far has been the way people inhabit the world with only the head and the rest of their being merely trails along behind. Consequently, those other human aspects are now guided by animal urges that indulge only untamed emotions, which we are currently experiencing and what we see spreading so strangely from the eastern part of Europe. This phenomenon arose because people have not been nurtured in their wholeness. It is not simply a matter of cultivating the artistic aspect. Our teaching itself in every subject must be drawn from the artistic realm. Every method must be permeated by the artistic element. Education must become a true art. The subject of the lesson itself should not become more important than the underlying basis. Drawing thus provides first the written forms of letters and then their printed forms. Based on drawing, we build up to reading. 
As you will see, this is how we strike a chord with which the souls of children happily vibrate, because they are then no longer interested in the external aspects, but see, for example, how a breathed sound is expressed in reading and writing. Consequently, we will have to rearrange much of how we teach. You will find that what we aim at in reading and writing today cannot, of course, be established exclusively as indicated here. All we can do is awaken the necessary forces as a basis. If we were to base our teaching only on the process of drawing, evolving toward reading and writing, modern life being what it is, we would have to keep the children in school until they were twenty. The normal period of education would not be enough. All we can do now is accomplish our method in principle while continuing to educate the children and retaining the artistic element. After working through the letters in this way for a while, we must make the children understand that adults are able to discover meaning in these strange shapes. While cultivating what the child has learned from isolated instances, we go on, parenthesis, regardless of whether the details have been understood, parenthesis, to writing whole sentences. In sentences, the children will notice shapes, for example, the F they are familiar with in fish. They will notice other shapes as well that cannot be addressed individually, because there will not be enough time. The next step is to write the various printed letters on the blackboard, and then, one day, we put a whole long sentence on the board and say to the children, quote, This is what adults see when they have formed everything in the way we formed the F in fish, unquote. Then we teach them to copy the writing, make sure that what they see passes through their hands, so that they not only read with their eyes, but also form what they read with their hands. In this way they come to know that they themselves can give form to whatever is on the blackboard. We do not let the children learn to read unless they can form what they see with their hands, both handwritten and printed letters. We thus accomplish something that is very important, Children never read with their eyes only, but the activity of the eyes passes mysteriously into the whole activity of their limbs. Children then feel unconsciously all the way into their legs, what would otherwise pass only through their eyes. Our aim is to understand the whole human being in this activity. Afterward we may reverse the procedure. We can fragment the sentence we have written, break up the words, and show the forms of the letters we have not yet derived from their elements we go from the whole to its parts. For example, if we have written the word head, the children learn to read head simply by copying it. Then we separate the word into its letters, H-E-A-D, and thus go from the whole to its parts. This sequence of starting with the whole and proceeding to its parts must in fact be present in all that we teach. In another situation, we could take a piece of paper and cut it into a number of pieces, we might count the pieces, let's say there are twenty-four, and say to the child, quote, Look, I described these pieces of paper I cut up by what I wrote here, twenty-four pieces of paper. Unquote. It could just as easily be beans or whatever. Quote, now watch carefully. I take some pieces of paper away and make another little pile. Then I make a third and fourth pile. I have made four little piles from the twenty-four pieces of paper. Now I will count the pieces. You are still unable to do that, but I can. The pieces in the first pile I will call nine, those in the second, five, those in the third, seven, and those in the fourth, three. You see, at first I had only one pile of twenty-four pieces of paper. Now I have four piles of nine, five, seven, and three pieces. It is all the same paper. If I gather it all together, I call it twenty-four. If I have it in four little piles, I call it nine, five, seven, and three pieces. Now, twenty-four pieces of paper are nine, five, seven, and three pieces together. Unquote. This is how I have taught the children to add. I did not start with the separate pieces from which a sum would be derived. This would, in fact, be out of keeping with the original nature of the human being. It is actually this reversed procedure that is appropriate to human nature. First, the sum is considered which is then divided into the separate parts. We teach children addition by reversing the usual procedure. We begin with the sum and then proceed to the addenda. Children will understand the concept of together 
much better this way than if we take the parts separately first and then bring them together in the usual way. Our teaching methods will have to differ from the ordinary. We will teach children the reversed way, so to speak, about what a total is as opposed to its separate parts. Then we can also expect a very different comprehension from the children than we would if we used the opposite procedure. You will discover what is most important about this method only with practical experience. You will notice how children immerse themselves in the subject in a very different way and how they will have a different capacity to absorb what is taught when you begin in this way. You can apply the opposite process for the next step in arithmetic. You say, quote, Now I will put all the pieces of paper together again. I take some away, making two piles, and call the pile I took away three. How did I arrive at three? By taking it away from the others. But when they were together I called the pile twenty-four. Now I have taken three away and called the remainder twenty-one. Unquote. This is how you proceed to the concept of subtraction. Once again, do not begin with the whole and what is to be subtracted. Instead, begin with the remainder that is left over and lead from that to the whole from which it came. Here you go by the reverse path. In this way, you can extend to all of arithmetic as an art the method of always going from the whole to its parts. You will see this later when we come to the methods for particular subjects. We must simply accustom ourselves to a teaching process that is very different from what we are used to. We proceed in a way that not only nurtures the subject we impart, which cannot, of course, be ignored, though a rather disproportionate amount of attention is given to it today, but also, at the same time, fosters the children's sense for authority. We say continually, quote, I call this twenty-four, or I call this nine, unquote. When I stress in lectures on spiritual science that a sense of, for authority must be nurtured between the ages of seven and fourteen, I do not mean that we must drill children into a feeling for authority. The element that is needed flows from the very technique of teaching, which reigns as an undertone. For example, a child listens and says, quote, Oh, he calls that nine, and he calls that twenty-four. Unquote. A spontaneous obedience arises by listening to a person teaching in this way. And children are thus permeated with what should emerge as a, the sense for authority. This is the secret. Any unnatural drilling of the sense for authority should not be included because of the very nature of the method. <clears throat> Next we must develop a fully conscious, ongoing desire to effect harmony of the will, feeling, and thinking, which do in fact work together when we, re when we teach in this way. It is a matter of continually guiding the will in the proper direction by avoiding false methods. We must stimulate the appropriate expression of a stronger will through the use of artistic methods. From the very beginning the same is served by painting and musical instruction. You will notice that early in the second period of life children are more receptive to authority in teaching through art. Consequently, we can accomplish the most in this sense during this period of children's lives using artistic methods. They will very effortlessly find their way into what we wish to communicate to them and take the greatest delight in rendering it by drawing or even painting. We should make sure, however, that they avoid merely imitative work. We must also remember to transport children back to earlier eras, but we should not act as though we still remain in those ages. People were different then. You will transport the children back to those earlier cultural ages that had a different disposition of soul and spirit. <clears throat> this is why when drawing we do not aim to make children copy anything. We teach them archetypal forms in drawing by showing them how to make one angle like this or another like that. We try to reveal the circle and the spiral to them. We begin with a form as such. What it imitates is unimportant. We simply try to awaken their interest in the form itself. You may recall a lecture in which I tried to awaken a feeling for the process of the acanthus leaf's development. There I explained that it is completely erroneous to believe that the acanthus leaf was copied as it appears in legend. Footnote, acanthus, bear's breech, is a perennial herb or shrub native to the Mediterranean, having pinnately lobed basal leaves 
with spiny edges and spiked white or purple flowers. Greek and Roman architects used stylized representations of its leaves on the capitals of Corinthian columns. See True Artistic Creation, Part 2, Lecture 1, From Architecture as a Synthesis of the Arts, Rudolf Steiner Press, London, 1999, Collected Works, 286. End of footnote. It simply arose from an inner formative impulse and was not felt until later. This resembles nature. Thus, it was not a matter of imitating nature. We must take this into consideration in relation to drawing and painting. This will finally put an end to the atrocious error that deadens human minds. Wherever people encounter something artificial, they might say it looks natural or unnatural. It is completely irrelevant to decide whether something is copied properly or not. Resemblance to the external should appear only as a secondary consideration. What should live in people is their intimacy with the forms themselves. Even when drawing a nose, we must relate inwardly to the shape of the nose, so that only later does the resemblance to the shape of a nose become obvious. In children between the ages of seven and fourteen, We can never awaken a sense of the inner laws of phenomena by imitating what is external. We must realize that what we are able to develop in children between the ages of 7 and 14 cannot be developed later. The forces active during that period fade. Later on, all that can arise is a substitution, unless the person is completely transformed through initiation, either naturally or unnaturally. I will now say something unusual. We must, however, refer back to the principles of human nature in order to be teachers in the truest sense today. In exceptional cases, there are those who can recover a certain amount later in life, but they would have had to go through a severe illness or suffered a deformity of some kind, for example, a broken leg that was then not set properly. In other words, it must have been something that caused a kind of loosening between the etheric body and the physical body. This, of course, is dangerous. When it happens because of karma, we can only accept it. But we cannot rely on it, nor can we pass a law saying that a person shall, in this way, make up for something missed, to say nothing of other matters. Human development is mysterious, and all that we strive for in teaching and education should never be concerned with the abnormal, but always with the normal. Teaching, therefore, is always a social matter, and we must always consider the appropriate age for developing specific forces, so that their cultivation will enable individuals to assume their positions in life in the right way. We must face the fact that certain capacities can unfold only between the seventh and fourteenth years in such a way that a person can cope with life later on. If such capacities are not developed during this period, people cannot contend with life's later struggles, and this is indeed the situation for most people today. As teachers we must provide those we educate with the ability to artistically assume their place in the activities of the world. Human nature, we will find, is such that we are, in a way, born musicians. If people are, excuse me, if people were sufficiently agile, they would dance and move in some way with all little children. We are born into the world in a way that makes us want to join the world with our own bodily nature in a musical rhythm and relationship. This inner musical capacity is strongest in children during their fourth, excuse me, third and fourth years. Parents could do a great deal if they would simply notice this, starting not so much with external musicality, but with an attunement of the physical body and the element of dance. It is exactly during this period of life that an infinite amount of good can be gained by permeating the bodies of little children with elementary eurythmy. If only parents learned to do eurythmy with their children, something very different would arise in them than is usual. They would overcome a kind of heaviness that lives in the limbs. We all have this heaviness in the limbs today, and this could be overcome. When children change their teeth, the foundation for everything musical would thus remain in them. The individual senses arise from this musical element, a musically attuned ear or an eye for shapes and forms. A musically attuned ear and an eye that appreciates line and form are specializations of the whole musical in of the whole musical human being. 
Thus we must cherish the idea that by drawing on the artistic element we assimilate the disposition of the entire human being into the upper or sensory human. Through music, drawing, or modeling, we lift the realm of feeling into the intellectual sphere. But this must happen in the right way. Today everything becomes blurred and mixed together, especially in cultivating the artistic. We both draw and model with our hands, and yet these two activities are completely different. This is expressed with particular clarity when we introduce children to art. When we guide children into the realm of something that can be modeled, we must, as much as possible, see that they follow the forms with their hands. By feeling their way, they make their own forms. By moving their hands and drawing, children are led to follow the forms with their eyes and also with the will emerging through their eyes. It does not violate their naivete to teach children to follow the forms of the body with the hollow of the hand, or to make them aware of their eyes, for example, by allowing children to follow a complete circle with their eyes and saying, quote, You are making a circle with your eyes. Unquote. This does not wound a child's innocence, but rather engages the interest of the whole human being. Consequently, we must become aware that we are lifting the lower part of the human being into the higher part, or sensory being. Thus we shall gain a certain feeling, which in turn becomes the foundation of our method. It is a feeling we must each cultivate in ourselves as teachers, since it cannot be imparted directly to anyone else. Imagine that we have here before us a human being, a child, whom we will teach and educate. As far as human education is concerned, perception of the child as a growing human being is vanishing today. Everything is confused. We must learn to differentiate in how we regard this child. We must, in a certain sense, accompany our teaching with inner sensations, with feelings, and with an inner stirring of the will that vibrates in a lower octave without being acted out. We must be aware that in a growing child the eye and the astral body develop gradually, and that owing to heredity the etheric and the physical bodies are there to begin with. It would be good to consider this. The physical and etheric bodies in particular are always cultivated from the head down. In fact, the head rays out what creates the physical human being. If we practice education properly in relation to the head, we serve the growth processes in the best way possible. When we teach children in such a way that the head aspect is drawn out of the whole being, then what is appropriate moves from the head to the limbs. That person grows better, learns to walk better, and so on. Consequently, we can say that if we develop everything related to the upper human being in the appropriate way, the physical and the etheric will flow downward. If, when we teach reading and writing in a more intellectual way, we have the feeling that the child is open to us while absorbing what we offer, it is sent out from the head into the rest of the body. The eye-being and astral body, on the other hand, are formed from below upward, when the child's whole being is encompassed by education. A strong feeling of the eye arises, for example, when we offer children elementary eurythmy between their third and fourth years. This claims the whole person, and a proper feeling of the eye, capital I, takes root in the child's being. Furthermore, when we often tell them things that bring them joy and other things that cause pain, the astral body takes form from the lower being up. For a moment just consider your own experiences a little more intimately. I suspect that you have all had this experience. While walking along the street something startled you. As a result you found that not only were your head and heart shocked, but the feeling of shock lingered on even in your limbs. You can conclude, therefore, that in surrendering to something, feelings and excitement are released and affect your whole being, not just the heart and head. Educators must keep this truth very clearly in mind. They must make sure that the child's whole being is moved. Consider from this point of view telling legends and fairy tales. If you have the right feeling for the stories and tell them from your own inner qualities, the way you tell them enables children to feel something of what is told with the whole body. Then you really address the child's astral body. 
Something radiates from the astral body up into the head, something that the child should feel there. You should have the sense that you are gripping the whole child, and that from the feelings and excitement you arouse, an understanding of what you are saying comes to the child. Thus you may consider that the ideal, when telling legends or fairy tales, or while drawing or painting with children, is not to explain anything or work with concepts, but to move their whole being. As a result, later on when they leave you, out of themselves they will understand what you told them. Try, therefore, to educate the eye-being and astral body from below upward, so that the head and heart follow later. Try not to tell the stories in a way that causes children to reflect and understand them in the head. Tell them in a way that evokes a kind of silent, thrilled awe within limits, and in a way that evokes pleasures and sorrows that continue to echo after the child has left you, gradually to be transformed into understanding and interest. Try to allow your influence to arise from your intimacy with the children. Try not to arouse interest artificially by counting on sensation. Instead, attempt to achieve an inner relationship with the children and then allow interest to arise from their own being. How can you do this with a whole class? It is relatively simple with an individual child. As long as you try to do things with a child only out of fondness and love for that child, you will find that you reach the whole being, not just the heart and head. And it is no more difficult to do this with a whole class if what you say and do moves you, and if you are not interested only with your heart and head. As a simple example, let's say that I wish to teach a child about the continuation of the soul's life after death. I would only deceive myself and never make it clear to the child if I taught only theories about it. There is no concept that can teach a child under fourteen about immortality. I could say, however, quote, See this chrysalis? It is empty. Once there was a butterfly inside, but it crept away. Unquote. I could also demonstrate the process of how metamorphosis happens. It is good to show such things to children. Then I make a comparison. Quote, Imagine that it is you who are the chrysalis. Chrysalis, your soul is inside you, and later it will emerge just as a butterfly emerges from its chrysalis. This, of course, is rather naively. Un- this, of course, is rather naively stated. I think there was an end of a quote there after chrysalis. <clears throat> you can talk about this for a long time. However, if you yourself do not believe that the butterfly is an image of the human soul. You cannot accomplish much with children by using this analogy. You should not allow yourself the false notion that this whole idea is merely a contrived comparison, which it is not. It is a fact presented to us by the divine cosmic order. These things are not invented by the intellect, and if our attitude towards such matters is correct, we come to trust the fact that all nature offers us analogies for the realities of soul and spirit. As we unite with what we teach children, the way we work affects their whole being. When we can no longer feel with children and instead offer only rational translations of everything that we ourselves do not believe in, we cease to teach children very much. Our relationship to reality must be such that, out of our own comprehension, we bring to children's souls more than an arbitrary picture of the butterfly emerging from the chrysalis for example, and instead presents something we ourselves understand and believe in as given by divine cosmic powers. We must not offer children understanding merely for their ears, but we must communicate from soul to soul. If you remember this, you will make progress. That's the end of Lecture 1 of Practical Advice to Teachers by Rudolf Steiner, given on August 21st, 1919.